Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tyler Jacks. I'm the director of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research here at MIT, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 12th annual Koch Institute Symposium. Uh, this is an event that we look forward to every year. Uh, we organize these symposia to highlight important new directions in cancer research and cancer treatment, often with a focus on uh, advanced science and advanced technology, which really speaks to the themes of the Koch Institute, which is organized around bringing together cancer scientists and cancer engineers to both advance our understanding of the disease, but also to develop uh, new solutions for long-standing problems in cancer. And these symposia sometimes reflect more the cancer science side, like recent ones we've done in metastasis or epigenetics and cell plasticity. Sometimes they emphasize more the technology side, like ones we've done on systems biology as well as nanotechnology. Um, today's symposium on cancer, immuno, uh, cancer immunology and immunotherapy uh, really touches both and goes even further. Um, certainly the science of the interaction between the immune system and developing cancers is extremely interesting, and several of our speakers will touch on that today. Um, but in addition to that, there are important technologies that are being brought to bear to improve the immune response against cancer uh, and to understand the immune response against cancer more fully. Uh, and when I say go beyond, what I really mean is this is being translated very, very rapidly uh, into clinical implementation. Uh, and several of our speakers will touch on that today. It's extremely exciting to see this science, which is not a new science, it's a science that's really been unfolding for more than a century, um, starting to have such an important impact uh, in the clinic and to the benefit of cancer patients. And so I think if there were a topic for us to, to discuss today um, in all areas of cancer research and cancer medicine, this is the one. So I'm really excited to uh, watch the day unfold. Uh, again, my main job this morning is to say welcome uh, and also to say thank you uh, to Daryl Irvin, whom I will introduce in a second, uh, one of the two co-organizers, Jen Su Chen, the other co-organizer from the Koch Institute, um, and also to many people behind the scenes who have contributed to making the preparation for the day and, and uh, getting things organized for today um, so successful. Pam DeFreya, Lori Spindler, Cindy Quince, and many others in the Koch Institute headquarters operation who um, volunteer their time to, uh, to pull things together in what it turns out to be a relatively complicated uh, process. But without further ado, uh, let me introduce Daryl Irvin, who is uh, going to moderate the first session and give an introduction uh, to today's topic. Uh, Daryl is a professor in the departments of material science and engineering, as well as biological engineering. Uh, he'll also be speaking on today's, um, in today's symposium. Uh, he is a cancer immunologist and immunoengineer, uh, and he will take you through um, an introduction to the topic as well as uh, moderate the first session. Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Tyler. Um, so I'm just gonna take a few minutes to set the stage for what I think it, I'm sure is gonna be a, a very exciting set of talks today. Um, we're really grateful for the folks who came in from uh, out of town to be with us today and tell you about some of the uh, exciting and important work that's, that's happening in cancer immunology uh, and immunotherapy. So uh, the, uh, as Tyler said, the, the KI Symposium is held each year and there's usually a theme um, that's driven by current events happening in the field and uh, it seemed that it was really due to have a meeting about immunology and cancer immunotherapy given the recent real uh, sea change in events happening uh, clinically with cancer immunotherapy. So uh, just to highlight a few of the things that are going to be touched on, I'm sure, several times throughout the day in the, in the talks, um, the approval of the first cancer vaccine, Provenge, that was uh, shown to extend survival in prostate cancer, the demonstration of the first example of an immunotherapy that could extend survival in metastatic melanoma. And this uh, approval of this drug, an antibody against uh, the regulatory molecule on T-cells, CTLA-4, particularly got people excited because of this tale of survivors that not only benefited from the drug, but looked like they're long-term uh, survivors. 
And this is just the leading edge, and, and these two uh, treatments are now FDA approved, and they're just the front edge of a number of new therapies that are showing tremendous promise in the clinic. Um, Carl June, our first speaker, is going to tell you about uh, adoptive T-cell therapy, an approach of taking lymphocytes from patients and re-engineering them to attack cancer, um, where they've shown uh, dramatic responses where patients uh, at, at the end stages of leukemia have shown uh, complete remissions. And then perhaps most recently, uh, following along the same line of thinking as the anti-CTLA-4 antibody, there are uh, clinical trials ongoing of antibodies interfering with negative signaling pathways through the PD-1, PD-L1, PD-L2 receptors that suppress immune responses against tumors. And antibodies against that, that are interfering with this signaling are starting to show just dramatic responses in patients with uh, 30 to 40 percent response rates in very difficult cancers, and not just uh, melanoma, not just liquid cancers, but some very challenging small uh, solid cancers. So all of this clinical advance uh, that I'm sure many people in the field feel is long overdue is uh, really coming to fruition now, and that's uh, one of the main drivers that, that led us to uh, bring both fundamental scientists here today and a number of uh, speakers who are going to talk about their clinical work in immunotherapy, because one of the most exciting things is the rapidity which with which things are moving uh, clinically uh, right now after many years of basic science pushing the field forward. Um, this from the New York Times just last week, uh, reporting on the uh, business side of, of the promise of these drugs and the sense that uh, industry is fully behind developing these therapies for patients, which now are starting to move from being very toxic and poorly effective to being uh, much less toxic and much more effective. Um, and that is one of the drivers that's led people to start really thinking that uh, cancer immunotherapy is entering a completely new age now. Um, so to, in the talks today, you're going to hear uh, both basic science, uh, important fundamental new insights into how the immune system recognizes and responds to cancer. You're going to hear about clinical advances that have been happening recently, uh, I'm sure both some published and unpublished data, and uh, we hope you'll stay and, and enjoy all of these uh, talks uh, to learn something about what's going on in this field. Um, I'd like to thank um, the sponsors and vendors who uh, supported the symposium this year and in many cases have supported the symposium many years. Um, uh, among the sponsors, I'd like to especially thank Agilent Technologies, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, uh, Metamune, and Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, I'd like to point out to all of the attendees that we have vendors uh, out in the lobby and in the tent who will be displaying things. Uh, please go take a look at what they have to show you uh, and, and mention, uh, in particular, cell signaling technology that's uh, supported uh, the KI Symposium every year since, since we started. So with that, um, just one housekeeping point. Um, given the setup of this room, uh, we traditionally in the, in the Koch Symposium don't have Q&A after the talk, so each speaker's been asked to stick to about 25 minutes. Um, and uh, if I'm sure you'll have many questions and things you'd like to discuss, the speakers will be around throughout the day and, and you can uh, try to connect with them during the coffee breaks. So with that, um, I think I'll uh, end and, and just go move on to introducing our first speaker um, for the day. Um, this is Professor Carl June, who's coming to us from the University of Pennsylvania. He's the Richard Vague Professor in Immunotherapy in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine in the Perelman School of Medicine. Um, he's the Director of, the Translation, of Translational Research in Penn's Abramson Cancer Center. Carl is a pioneer in uh, leading the clinical development of adoptive T-cell therapy approaches, uh, not only in cancer, but also in infectious disease. And uh, I'm sure he's going to tell us about some of the dramatic things that he's finding in the clinic today. Carl. Well, thanks very much, uh, Daryl. It's really an exciting uh, day, I'm sure. So, um, by way of disclosure, the technology I'm going to present has been uh, licensed to Novartis, and uh, we have a conflict of interest management plan. Um, 
So there are three major uh, fundamental laws of immunology uh, that are uh, summarized in Bill Paul's book. Uh, one being that uh, it can be the most targeted of therapies because both B and T cell receptors uh, can recognize virtually any structure. Um, but the second law is the one that has been the, the, the problem with cancer immunology, which is that the immune system has multiple ways to establish tolerance and prevent the destruction of cancer. The third law is what less well appreciated, which is that the response is context dependent. So the antigen may be the same, but the, the immune response, and for instance, a skin-based tumor like melanoma, is very different than it is to a gastrointestinal malignancy such as pancreatic cancer. So we now know multiple mechanisms, and you're going to hear more later today about how tolerance is maintained and then how to overcome those. Uh, uh, but the first two mechanisms, uh, tolerance through epithymus and, and, and uh, clonal elimination, lead to a fundamental issue for most cancers, especially non-virally induced cancers, that they're that the T cell receptor avidity is low and, and the T cells just really never get fully activated. So and synthetic biology um, allows uh, now two approaches to address this. One, one is, is introducing new T cell receptors into cells that have affinity enhancement um, and, uh, uh, and then creating bispecific T cells. Uh, these then have to be HLA matched to the patient and to the tumor. Um, and the other approach is the so-called CAR, which stands for chimeric antigen receptor, or sometimes referred to as a T body. It's, it's chimeric in that it has an antibody expressed in a T cell. Um, and and uh, the difference in, at, at one level is that this is more off the shelf because it doesn't have to be MHC matched and, and it's not MHC independent. Um, uh, we've worked with Bent Jakobson, who's at Adapt Immune and uh, a spin out from uh, uh, Oxford. And they have st probably the largest collection of T cell receptors against in, in humans. And, and if you look at the KD by Biacore, this is what the, the range they've seen with the highest affinity down at uh, about one nanomolar. And uh, um, but if you look at a collection of cancer antigens that they've isolated, the, the affinity is, is about two logs lower. Um, and uh, so um, the, these are uh, from T cell receptors isolated from patients, the highest being one against uh, a cancer testis antigen, ESO1. Um, so one approach to overcome this tolerance and the synthetic approach is to enhance the affinity of these. There are several ways to do this, and these are in clinical trials. Um, we have a clinical trial at our center with ESO1 and MAGE3 T cell receptors, and, and Phil Greenberg and others are starting with trials against WT1. And uh, um, I, I won't show those results today, but we've had uh, very uh, vigorous responses in both patients with melanoma as well as sarcomas uh, with, with engineered T cell receptors. Um, and, and so at this point, we don't know which approach really is, quote, better. I think they're both going to end up being FDA-approved therapies um, using e either engineered T cell receptors or CARs. The, the T cell receptor is one of the most sensitive uh, signaling molecules derived in evolution, probably only second to uh, photon receptors in the eye. Um, and, it can, and it can be triggered by as few as one to 10 peptides on an MHC molecule. The cars require about 200 molecules on the surface to be triggered, although that's without trying to enhance their signaling uh, efficiency. So, um, and we're not sure if they need to be more potent on their signaling uh, uh, amplification. T cell receptors in nature are low avidity. However, this can be enhanced by engineering. And, and with CARs using standard antibody engineering, the avidity can be controlled. Uh, the T cell receptor has a larger set of targets uh, because it targets the intracellular proteome, whereas CARs target the surface uh, structures on tumor cells. Um, an advantage for CARs is that they're MHC independent, so that it's not uncommon in human tumors that they lose MHC class one, either the processing, and in fact, at surgery, about half of ovarian cancers have, have uh, defects in proteasomal or in the TAP transporters and don't express class one alleles or their peptides. Um, and 
We know that T cell receptors can last for the lifetime of a patient uh, through clonal persistence of the, of the cells. Um, and um, we don't yet know in T cells with CARs. Uh, the longest data is from the first patients we treated in HIV with a so-called first generation in CAR. And there with linear effects mixed modeling analysis, the survival is between 17 and 23 years. That's the half-life of these CARs. So they're very long-lived and probably equivalent in patients without cancer to, to natural T cells or maybe even have better survival. Um, but we don't yet know uh, in cancer patients. Our longest data is about three years now, and I'll show some of that. So CARs now are being uh, evolved in a number of laboratories to, to change the signaling domains. In general, they have antibody-based recognition domains. And they initially began uh, with trials that we did with cell genesis using uh, a single zeta chain domain from the T cell receptor. And then uh, so-called tandem uh, molecules are being tested now that have uh, two signaling domains, the zeta chain and either CD28 or a, a TNF family member such as 4MBB, and then triple and more are also in various laboratories and beginning trials. Um, and I'll show uh, the, the trials here that have uh, tandem signaling domains. Um, so Mike Malone, when he is my lab, and Carmine Carpenito built a family of these cars against CD19, and then expressed either CD28 or 4MBB with the zeta chain. And it turns out there's a position-dependent effect and, and dependence on uh, the transmembrane domains. Um, and with using an HIV-based lentivirus, they can be brightly expressed. This is detecting the CD19 on primary T cells uh, and uh, whether there's a, a, a truncated signaling domain or uh, all three domains, they're brightly expressed using an internal promoter in this case. Uh, EF1 alpha, which drives a brightest expression on human T cells. The one we took into the clinic has 4 and BB and Zeta, and the reason for that is this experiment that Mike Malone did where he expressed all these in primary T cells, and here just activated through the endogenous T cell receptor and did not uh, present CD19, and there was a logarithmic uh, d a division of the T cells after the CD the T cell receptor stimulation, as shown by population doublings. But one car kept proliferating, and the others all rested down unless they're re-stimulated. And this is the one that has 4 and BB. So there's ligand-independent signaling through this car. And the reason we chose that then was to enhance uh, proliferation of the cars in patients. Um, and uh, that turned out to be, I think, important to the results we've had. So there have been a number of trials now testing uh, either CD20, which is a rituximab antibody done by Ali Preston's and his colleagues in hematologic malignancies, all targeting B cells, or CD19, uh, that have been uh, conducted. And uh, we, we did ours with the 4MBB Zeta, and the rest have used either Zeta only or CD28 and Zeta. Um, one hallmark of this is that they've all been done in academic centers, and if you lift them you know, like in alphabetical order, uh, so this is something that's come through entirely through the academic uh, uh, university-based development, and until recently there's been no um, involvement with biotech or pharmaceutical industry. So our initial trial was in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is uh, the most common B-cell malignancy in adults. Um, it, it is about 15,000 cases a year in the U.S., and it's not curable in, in less an allogeneic transplant's done. And, and most patients, due to comorbidities and age, are not eligible for allogeneic bone marrow transplant. And the T cells in patients with CLL don't work normally. So it's a disease that progresses and causes a progressive immunodeficiency. And, and they usually, the patients die either with bone marrow replacement or with infections, much like an AIDS patient. And if you take healthy, uh, patient donor T cells. These are age matched to CLL patients and stimulate them with antigens. There's much more division in normal T cells than there is in CLL patients, and that can be shown here. These are studies from John Gribben. Um, so, one issue with CLL is that it induces uh, an energy or exhaustion like issue in T cells, and that's something that can be repaired, uh, our studies show, with uh, adoptive transfer approaches. So the, the approach we do has uh, five steps um, for in the clinical trials. One is to obtain T cells from the patient, and we use either an apheresis procedure uh, in the blood bank or just blood donation. 
Uh, and then we use a, a, a VSVG retargeted uh, or pseudotyped HIV third generation vector to introduce the car that has 4MBB and Zeta. And then uh, the cells are cultured for 10 days, frozen in DMSO. And then the patient, depending uh, on the clinical situation, may or may not get chemotherapy in order either to uh, hold them uh, stably uh, during the manufacturing process or to uh, induce lymphodepletion, which then allows for more, more homeostatic expansion of the CAR T cells when they're infused. Uh, so our, our initial trial is shown here. Um, we just finished the enrollment of the first 14 patients in this trial uh, this uh, early this spring. And it's the first trial to test an HIV-based lentiviral vector in patients and to express a car that had 4MBB in it and, and it, as I mentioned, was driven the constitutive expression of the car with an EF1-alpha promoter. So the patients to be eligible for the trial had to have CLL that had progressed after at least two FDA-approved therapies. They've had a meeting of six prior therapies. Uh, and then they got a single infusion of chemotherapy uh, a week after their previous, uh, a, a single infusion of the CARs uh, after their uh, 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 so-called dealer's choice chemotherapy. And um, we have had uh, quite striking responses. We didn't know initially if we were just basically lucky with these patients or would they be durable and repeatable. So this is uh, an example of a patient who had a P53 deficiency, so 17P, uh, that was homozygous, which is generally that makes patients resistant to chemotherapy. And in fact, this patient was treated with three cycles of bendamustine, uh, an alkylating agent. And his lymphocyte count, which is basically all leukemia cells, is shown here in red. The upper limit of normal of white blood cell count is shown on that reference line. And so he was refractory to the bendamustine, as you can see, and or rituximab. Then with the CARs, he had a precipitous uh, drop in, in his, uh, and cleared all leukemic cells from the blood. He also had what we found out later was a tumor lysis syndrome and cytokine release syndrome that I'll describe later, and he was given corticosteroids at this point. Uh, he had a long-term partial remission. The other two patients that we treated initially with our first vector lot had complete responses, and this shows an example of bone marrow cleared out of leukemia and lymph nodes here that are axillary that, that disappeared uh, within uh, three months. And at this point now, we now have treated 22 patients as of May, and uh, that, those first patients remain in a complete response. So these are durable without any repeated infusions, uh, and the patients have only one side effect, which is B cell aplasia, and I'll discuss that more. Um, and so we've seen a very high response rate with a 59% overall response rate in, in these patients with the refractory uh, leukemia. They're elderly, an average age is 65 years old. Um, and the, the blood and bone marrow have a kinetics of a response uh, where it's, uh, it disappears within about a month. Um, it's very rapid, unlike a cancer vaccine response. However, we have had delayed responses of large masses in some cases. And this is a, an elderly 78-year-old man who had a large 15-centimeter uh, periaortic abdominal mass, mesenteric nodes, and, and, and mass here that two months later was partially gone, and six months later, much, much gone, and a year, it's all resolved. So we don't know the mechanism of the long-term delay, whether that re reflects just time required or whether there's other mechanisms other than direct killing by the uh, infused uh, car cells. Um, we've been able to assess the, the pharmacology of these cells and pharmacokinetics by uh, measurement of the 4MBB transgene in blood by PCR and, and in bone marrow samples, as well as by uh, staining the cells. And uh, the first three patients all had uh, 2 to 4 log 10 proliferation of the cells in vivo. So, and these cells were, were administered by inf IV infusion and then no growth factors such as IL-2 given to the patient. And what was surprising is that at six months, they all had um, persistence of these cars and, and at levels that reflect a contraction of a couple of logs after the initial expansion. The peak time of this expansion is when they have um, tumor lysis syndrome and, uh, and cytokine release syndrome, and then the cells contract, and, and our first two patients uh, still have cars uh, out at three years after infusion. Um, and this just shows the third patient treated. 
um, who had these kinetics here of a response. He had the lowest dose and a more delayed peak. And at this time point here, at 60 days, by staining, um, uh, about 27% of the CD8 cells express the single chain antibody fragment. So this is, is pretty exciting then that now uh, an infusion of T cells can lead to long-term antibody delivery and not have to have the recursive in, uh, infusion that we do normally with antibodies every three to four weeks. So the CARs now are expressed long-term um, in, in these uh, patients. And the data we have so far uh, indicates that the proliferation of the CARs is um, associated with responses. So the patients who have complete responses, this is a log-log scale, have uh, more than 1,000 CARs per microgram of genomic DNA by a month or so after infusion. And the patients who haven't responded don't have the CAR infusion. They engraft, but they don't have this expansion in the patients. We suspect that may be related to the patient's uh, anergic phenotype with CLL or, and or exhaustion. We, we don't yet know uh, on that. But, so the CRs are durable in patients. And, and the, the CARs remain functional. And the reason we know that is that they have uh, sustained B-cell aplasia. Normally, B-cells would recur after um, uh, any chemotherapy uh, and, and return from bone marrow-derived progenitor cells. But these two patients had leukemia circulating in the blood. This is CD19 and CD20 staining. Uh, at baseline, and then at a year and, and 18 months in this patient, you can see there's no more leukemia, but there's also no B cells. So uh, there should be three or five percent cells here that would be B cells. So this shows a very deep um, B cell aplasia and, and indicates that there's ongoing function of the, of the CAR cells. Um, we, we actually ex expected these CAR cells to be um, rejected in the patients because it has a mouse antibody, the single-chain variable fragment is a murin hybridoma. And we um, don't know the mechanism, but assume it's due to a tolerance induced by the T cells uh, that, that have eradicated the B cells that would have made uh, antibodies against the mouse chimeric protein. We believe that there's a response and relationship of the tumor burden to the patient's T cells, so uh, the CAR T cell proliferation. Our initial patients had between three and seven pounds of tumor at baseline when we looked both at the bone marrow and peripheral blood and lymph node compartments by uh, CT imaging. And, and then we believe that drives the CAR expansion in part because we've now treated some patients with ALL who have less tumor burden and there's less CAR expansion. The long-term safety of the CAR T cells will be you know, established in ongoing trials. The FDA requires that patients who get therapy with an integrating viral vector need to be followed for 15 years. Um, and we didn't know CLL is a disease where the, T cell, the, the tumor cells basically have an apoptotic defect and accumulate. Only about 1% are in S phase. So what would happen in a more rapidly growing malignancies? Um, and we, and the field now know that the CARs can work in, in rapidly growing uh, acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. So at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Rainier Brinkins and, and his colleagues have just recently published uh, a series of five patients, adults with ALL, and, and we published our first two patients with pre b -CLL, who were pediatric patients. And what, what we can find from this is that they have a very high response rate and that the toxicity in adults and children is similar as to what I've just shown you. The first patient was reported at the hematology meetings last December and then published in the New York Times before recent publication last month in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is her fever course and, and tumor lysis course. So the T cells were infused here. She had refractory LL and no chemotherapy was given. And this fever curve goes from 37 to 41. And at, when her temperature was given at 106 degrees, she was given steroids and then Enbrel, which blocks tocilizumab, and the response uh, was that it was refractory to high-dose corticosteroids and TNF inhibitor. Uh, then we gave an anti-IL-6, and she had a prompt resolution of the fever, and then, um, and then uh, entered into remission. So the cytokines in this patient here are shown. So C19 positive pre bll baseline cytokines, and then uh, on a log scale here to their, um, from baseline levels, the, the kinetics of this 
very closely uh, uh, model what we saw for fever. Uh, and the high cytokines here that are a thousandfold of ba above baseline are interferon gamma and IL-6. Ongoing studies are uh, determining the origin of this, but we believe it's both from macrophages as well as the CAR T cells. The cytokines probably are not coming from the tumor cells as they die because we see this both in CLL and ALL, the same pattern. So very similar patterns in the adults as well as pediatric patients when they get the same CAR infusions. So we've had a very high response rate. This is the first patient that was in the New York Times who's now out past a year in, in, in remission. And, and so as of last May now, we have uh, about a 90% overall response rate in refractory ALL. Many of these patients have relapsed after an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, and there's never been a therapy that has, has worked in that setting. So this looks very promising, and, and if anything, the results may actually be better than it is in, PD, in, in adult CLL. So this is the kinetics, the tumor response in that first patient, where in a bone marrow, we could look for so-called tumor infiltrating CAR cells. And, and at six days after infusion, there were about 3%. This is staining for an anti-idiotype and CD3 staining here. So there were some T cells in the bone marrow, but lots of tumor. So even you know, six days after treatment, still 47% of the cells in the bone marrow were blasts. But then 17 days later, there's now a, a really very robust proliferation of CAR T cells in the bone marrow and now of, of no more tumor cells. So that represents about a kilogram of tumor, if you look at the bone marrow volume, can be eradicated by CAR cells within 17 days. Um, and she was given no chemotherapy and remains in, in a very deep remission. Um, we have done molecular analysis looking for the, the, uh, the rearranged B cell receptor. And at baseline, um, all of the, the B cells were clonal, um, and 98% here in both blood and bone marrow. And then there was a progressive clearing from uh, marrow samples, so, but it required six months where now after when we look at a million genome sequences, we can't find any of the malignant cells. Um, and we can also now, with these pediatric cases where there's this very rapid proliferation, this shows the copies of the CAR in peripheral blood and in cerebral spinal fluid, that they go up to essentially 100% of the cells are CAR cells uh, at 10 to 20 days after treatment. Um, and this reference line here would be 1% in that peripheral blood. So morphologically, if you do a, a complete blood count and a right stain, this is what these CARs look like. Statistically, these are CARs 10 days after treatment. They're activated effector cells. And Surprisingly, we found that they traffic into the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, neither of these first two patients had um, leukemia in the cerebral central nervous system. So we found them there by both flow cytometry and um, by uh, the molecular assay for PCR for the 4MBB transgene sequence. And, and if you do a, a cytospin, this is what these cars look like in the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, so they traffic to the CNS uh, and persist in, in, our, in our first patient that we have data on. Um, we had, in our second patient, had a, a very immature pre-B cell ALL that was CD34 positive and CD19 dim positive at baseline. And they had CD45 um, uh, dim here. And so that's where we can gate on these, both in the marrow and the peripheral blood. At a month after treatment, there's no more CD19 positive cells, and this major fraction was gone, and her bone marrow at that point was a remission bone marrow. However, at two months after treatment, she relapsed with this population in the peripheral blood, but now there's CD19 negative. So this is our first example of a target loss where the patient has had um, recurrence with CD19 uh, loss of target. We don't yet know the mechanism of this, whether it was a biphenotypic malignancy from the beginning, or this was a, a mutation that evolved. Um, I've mentioned the toxicities. They're all on target, one being B cell aplasia, the other tumor lysis syndrome that occurs at the peak of the CAR proliferation. And um, with that cytokine release syndrome, which I'll, I'll just show a little bit more, I've shown you the cytokines that are mainly it's IL-6 and interferon gamma. And surprisingly, because we didn't see this in our mouse xenograft preclinical data, we've seen uh, what hematologists refer to as 
hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis or uh, macrophage activation syndrome, MAS. And that's a syndrome characterized by high ferritin levels. Uh, in two cases, more than 500,000 nanograms per mil, uh, C-reactive protein and, and D-dimers in the blood, and then the cytokines that I mentioned, and hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow. Um, uh, and and I've, we've also seen tumor lysis syndrome, which has been delayed as far as uh, 50 days after the infusion of the CARS. This is the second patient we had called uh, uh, his UPN-02, but it was a third subject we treated peak of CARS here that was 23 days after infusion, and biochemically, these are the findings of a tumor lysis syndrome with elevated uric acid, LDH, and renal failure that all resolved within about a month after medical management. Um, so I mentioned we, we, we treated with anti-IL-6 based on the cytokine findings that we have that as a dominant cytokine. So cytokine blockade works in children as well as adults. This is patient nine in our CLL trial who is having fever between 99 and 103 degrees uh, here with vital signs every six hours. And on day 10, he was given tocilizumab, and, and you can see it's like a rheostat that's been reset. So these are uh, not associated with infection. Uh, you know, it's culture-negative fever uh, and associated with uh, chills and, and rigors. Um, so at this point, we have found really uh, um, Robust responses in, in the 35 patients we treated, 22 with CLL and 13 with ALL. The first patient was treated in July of 2010. And so the issue now is not does it work, but how can we scale this out? Um, so at Penn, we treated 35 patients, but how, how do you treat 1,000? Um, so Novartis, that's their job, is to try to scale out the manufacturing. And, and Chris Mason has written a review on this. Uh, saying that cell therapies will add a fourth pillar. Right now, medicine is, is a pharmaceutical industry, biotechnology, and medical devices, and, and he is proposing that we'll have a fourth pillar of cell therapies, of which one will be engineered T cells. There's a number of issues on this. The logistics are daunting. Um, there, there are patient-specific treatments, uh, so-called N of one. Each one is FDA-approved, the lots. Whether it will be done with a blood bank, sort of like model, like the Red Cross has done with uh, centers, uh, specialized centers at hospitals, or will it be done with a central manufacturing. Uh, Novartis has purchased a manufacturing center and is, is now equipping that uh, for car therapy. Um, and the real issue, though, is, is the manufacturing and the, not the science anymore, but the engineering of the system. And, what I hadn't realized was this, was that cars, the ones initially made by Henry Ford on a manufacturing line, are, are were initially put together by uh, specialized technicians. They're now done robotically and automatically with about 80% of a car assembled with robots. Um, and our, our current manufacturing system is T cells are incubated with paramagnetic beads that we made about 20 years ago in my lab that have uh, CD3 and CD28 antibodies attached. They're then, at the end of the culture, the beads are removed by passage over a magnetic field, and then the cells are cryopreserved. This needs to be made uh, robotic uh, and not done with technicians uh, if it's gonna be scaled out to, to treat um, more common cancers other than leukemia. And there are a number of issues on automation that have been considered by uh, engineers, um, and, and it depends basically on how complex the tasks are uh, versus um, how, uh, or is it routine? So if you make a Volkswagen where there's very few options, it's very highly automated, but if you make a Lamborghini that's very customized, then it's gonna be hands-on culture and, and assembly. Uh, so where we are at this point are that um, um, Novartis is now gonna begin phase two trials, both in ALL and CLL. With the NCI, we're uh, doing so-called uh, strap study with Rainier Brankens comparing the car that we've made that has a foreign BB signaling domain to the, the CD28 based car uh, made at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And the late, largest field in the, question, in, the, in the field probably, the largest question is whether this approach will work on solid tumors. There's a number of early pilot stage trials uh, testing this. How often will target loss occur? And, uh, um, and one approach for that that we're making is to have a combination of cars to prevent that. Uh, the the, the uh, culture issue, which is outscaling, not scale up, 
needs to be addressed by, the, uh, by uh, biotechnology and, and uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And I think a, a near-term goal is to ask whether cars can replace allergenic bone marrow transplantation, a, a procedure that's complicated with graft-versus-host disease, and could be more widely available if autologous uh, cells are used. A um, number of labs are looking at so-called smart cars. Can we engineer cells so that they work in Boolean-gated logic? and then have more specific effects. I mean, right now, our toxicity is CD19-based, and, and one can live without B-cells because B-cell aplasia is manageable with IV uh, gamma globulin replacement therapy, but for other non-dispensable tissues, uh, such as tumors of the, of the lung and brain and so on, we have to have very specific CARs. So, so this is something, is a, another synthetic biology approach of next generation CAR generation. So the number of people have been involved in the studies that I've mentioned. Uh, Bruce Levine led our cell manufacturing at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Michael Kalos, the immune analysis. David Porter led the adult CLL trial. And Stephen Grupp and a, and a group of uh, clinicians at Children's Hospital are, are doing the pediatric ALL trials. And uh, 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 Michael Malone and, and uh, others in my lab who have developed the car. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh,